I think it's quite difficult for someone that doesn't have a formal education. In other words, someone that went through the education system for a long period of time. Doesn't mean people can't learn. And sometimes there's an advantage to it by not going into a system for so long. That's, it's not a criticism of education. In some ways it is. More so of the system, I think. My name is Bernard Sweeney and I'm an Irish traveller. I'm based here in the northwest of Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Sligo. And I'm going to talk about something that seems to be complex for a lot of people and may well be complex for a lot of reasons. But when I think of the issues that are existing today uh, right across the world, including racism, I still can't help feel um, there's something about all of that that's missing. I think the reason it has been missing is because there have been no Irish travellers in the past, I think, that would have come with this perspective. I mean, they would have known, they would have sensed it, they would have felt it. They might have read bits and pieces of other people wrote, but they've never heard it literally coming from a community that's 0.7% of the general Irish population that has a seven times higher suicide rate that is deemed as a neck-neck minority, exclusion, segregation, institutionalization. These words I use are part and parcel of a system that has existed here for a very long time and has been in existence for an incredible, incredible long time. So I don't come on as an educator or someone that did go to school um, I can only be as intelligent as I can. I can only know what I know. I'm always willing to learn. That's part of my life journey was trying to learn. Uh, when you're a traveler, you're for all the exclusions, um, low expectations being put upon you. And of course, you inheriting them low expectations over time. It makes it quite difficult to seek out answers that you might be looking for. So I think this is reminiscence with a lot of um, ethnic and minority peoples around the world. You might think this is another Irish person claiming some linkage to slavery and we too were oppressed and all of that. You might think it's just another white person talking about race issues. Um, and I suppose when you're coming from that mentality in your own perspective, that's, where, that's what it looks like. But there's something I feel has been missing from all of this for a very long time. And that was the Irish traveler perspective. Um, one that, let me, yeah, let me try to explain if I can, uh, best I can, who Irish travelers are. And that way then you might get a slight understanding of the mentality that I come from and why it is different, despite the fact using the same language, uh, known as the English language, that it's still different. Um, Irish travellers are classed as an ethnic minority in Ireland, an indigenous uh, ethnic minority. In other words, it's, this other mentality is trying to tell us that we were failed Irish settled people. We couldn't cut it, couldn't make it, couldn't keep up. And for all these various other reasons, uh, we fell behind. We didn't evolve like the majority. And, who sometimes refer to themselves as the normal people. So we had all these disadvantages and the exclusion. And we went through, I went through my lifetime uh, bombarded. You know, we were tinkers. I wasn't even quite sure what that was. We were itinerants. I had no idea what that was. Vagrants uh, were gypsies. We came from a different country. We came from a different culture. And all of this um, being told something that was going against your grain, something that didn't make sense. Because when you're a traveler, when you're coming from the traveler aspect of all of this, from within our own small little community, we still had our own culture, our own self-belonging. And all these words, <clears throat> all these words really only mean, when we say culture and self-belonging and traditions, all it really means is how we think. In other words, our mentality. Um, I like various different mentalities with different cultures, different languages. But there was one domineering mentality, one domineering culture that seemed to impact on our way of thinking, and our way of being. 
so they would keep reminding us of how inferior we are and we're victims and pressing, uh, pressing and pushing people down as much as they possibly could. Um, so yeah, and it's not a victim uh, whole situation. It's not like we're playing the victim. Uh, knock, knock, let us in, or sorry, or anything like that. Again, I think it'll come maybe more apparent why I can explain it, but also we try to keep an open mind about it. In other words, if we could switch off all of these labels, travelers, settled, white, black, brown, Protestant, Catholics, Muslims, we could just park them all for a moment because they're all constructs, things that we, we know of, no, we know of because there's somebody else that's, that are, seems to be different to that. So if there's Christians, it seems to be Muslims. If there's Muslims, it's Christians. If there's white, there's black. If there's black, there's white. Despite we all go together, but in these ways of thinking, there have been so many categories and so many labels that people believe they're different species and all this kind of stuff. Um, so I think this might be important to understanding mentalities. And hopefully then that way we can get a kind of a, so understanding where I'm coming from. So I'll try to take my time and just be relaxed about it and understand that I not get it all correct or I make claims of it, I make a mess of it. And all of that kind of stuff is very possible of happening. But I'm only basing on this on what I know, what I understand, what I've learned. So I'm using words that I would have normally had used uh, and so on and so forth. But these words, nonetheless, all of them belong to a particular mentality. They don't originally come from here. They don't originally come from anywhere. Well, they have an origin. But they're not like, this particular mentality is not like any of the other human mentalities. And when I say that, I mean it's language. And language becomes a big part of mentality. It influences you how to think and feel and emotions and understanding things, all of that. It's a great tool, but it was created and it was uh, assembled and it was administrated through institutions and schools over the centuries. So whether you liked or not, you were getting this uh, new form mentality imprinted into your brain, I suppose. This may sound a bit out there, but if you think about it in terms of invasions, and how the colonized uh, now have to adapt all the laws and the language and the traditions of the dominant invaders, uh, regardless of what language it might be, this has happened throughout history. But this particular one we're talking about, the one we're speaking, has a different kind of origins and it's a different kind of system, based on my understanding. So, <clears throat> as an Irish traveller from this ethnic minority community, um, on our side of the world, on our understanding, we're seeing it slightly different now, because we too are learning and um, taking information wherever we can get it because only 1% of our community uh, makes us into third level education, for whatever the reasons, lots of reasons, but too many to go into now. Um, and people might say, well, that's their own doing. People want an education, they should get an education. Well, I'm one of them people in that 1%. No, actually not, I'm the other 99 who didn't go into universities or colleges. Doesn't mean I didn't learn from educated people from various uh, universities or colleges or just Joe blogs and Jane blogs, it didn't matter. But when you're looking for something and you're trying to find the answers thing, you're pretty much taken in by just about everything. Uh, so you might take little snippets here and there and you bring them together yourself and try to create this understanding from it. That's probably the whole idea of books, rather than repeating them and reciting them and quoting them. Let's try to understand them differently. Um, Again, this was this might this conversation might sound like. It might sound like I'm ranting and raving and going different places at different times, and it might get confusing for you. So this is why I think we should try to keep you open mind and close off the mentality or emotions or feelings and all that kind of stuff. And just try to go with it the best we can without labels. There are no black, there are no white, there is no racism, there is no concept such as such as such as such a. And switch them all off and just go with it. So whatever you think afterwards, then good one. And I try to explain where I'm trying to come from, I think. Uh, with limited uh, formal education, uh, what I scrap, scrape together myself. So even my presentation is not me trying to um, mimic or copy some educated type lecturer or teacher. It's me trying to bring what I think I know into somewhat of a coherent <laughs> understanding. And that way then, 
it might be important. I believe Irish Chambers are fundamentally important to all global issues at the moment. And that's a huge statement to make, given that we're only 0.7% of the Irish population, who's about four and a half million people. A back garden somewhere in Australia. Um, that's how important I believe this is. And when it comes to mentalities, there are, are experts of all kinds, and they could lay me to waste in a few words. That's very possible. But I've also tried to rely on renowned experts also. So don't go into this wholeheartedly guessing and uh, alone. Uh, you know, there's people like Noam Chomsky, who's a world-renowned uh, professor, very intelligent man on various different things, but he has a certificate of some sort on linguistics, which means a study of languages. So he, and study of languages is a bit like, um, remember the travel documentaries and all that kind of documentaries where you trace your ancestral origins through the lands and where you might have gone from them, what tribe you might have came from originally, all that kind of stuff. Well, he does that in it with languages. Well, not just him, there's other people also. But he's the most world renowned. So I'm using him as a kind of a, to let you know that I'm not coming in this thinking I watched Joe Blogs, Billy Beans on YouTube or anything like that. Uh, and also it, it embeds into who I am as a person. In other words, if we're against this other mentality and we come from a different mentality, with a different origin, a different beginning, a different past, a different way of understanding the world, of course we're going to be in a conflict with the one we're meeting today, even the one we're using today. But during this, hopefully, you'll you try to understand some of this. You might think this guy needs a lot of help, or you might get it, you might sense it, you might think it's even too simplistic that where did you hear this, where did you read this, where did you see this, where can you point us to it? I've been asked many times what the experts say, what the professionals say, and sometimes you wouldn't know how to answer it because you're thinking, you can't explain that it. it's just sequence and little sentences and expressions and whatnot that comes from various different parts of the world around you. The more you see of it, the more you can pick up on it. I'm not trying to say that I'm overly complex, that I know all things, I know very little about anything. But the little, little, little bits I do know are connected to the big bits a lot of people would know more about. So I'm trying to say that I'm stepping outside of this mentality, this English-speaking mentality. And again, with the open mind, it is not anti-English. It's not anti-Protestant, it's not anti-Catholic, it's not anti-settled. There is no such thing in this conversation. It's just talking, human beings wiping the mentality clean for a moment, using the mind to focus on the mentality. The mentality is another word I suppose. Oh yeah, when I say mentality, then all the words I use are based on my understanding. Some of them defy contradictions in um, other parts of the settled all, or the other big wide world, whichever way you want to look at it. So when I say mentalities, um, you might think, or people who are into that, I think of the limbic system, a part of the brain. And this particular part of the brain stores memories and feelings and emotions and thoughts and dreams, history and experiences and all that stuff goes in there. And then that becomes your lived experience, that becomes your reality. And there's nothing more real than being in that. But given it's just one mentality, and particularly one that was constructed, uh, because we weren't born into this environment. It was created here when we got here, kind of thing. The laws, the policies, the documents, the institutions, the education, all these systems were here when we got here. And we just grew up within them, so to speak. So when I'm speaking of mentalities, that's pretty much what I'm talking about. And why the English mentality and its colonial and imperial uh, creations is because I believe this mentality, like its language, going back to Noam Chomsky, Noam Chomsky was about to say that the English language is about 1500 years old, and it is not like any other human language. Now, it doesn't mean it's an alien language, that it came from Mars or anything like that. What he means by that, it's not an organic language. It's not something like the Irish language, or any of the African languages, or any of the languages of the native tribes throughout America, throughout time. Is that even like the French language or the Italian language or any of these other languages? He's saying that it's not like them other human languages. So in other words, it was constructed differently. 
and brought into existence quite differently. If you think of most mentalities and languages, they are created of our environments, the way we go, the way we flow, and it advances and evolves. But the English one was constructed about 1500 years ago. And even Noam Chomsky would say it's like a system language. And it makes sense, because if you look up the language itself, it was created 1500 years ago. And it seemed to be used as a trade language. And even the origins of its words were very blunt. Where other languages were writing vast amounts of literature in their beautiful respected languages of the world, stars, the science, the histories, the folklore, all this kind of stuff. Its first book, when I say it's, this particular mentality, first book was about a werewolf, killing people, hating people. That was their first sign of creativity. And I'm not criticizing it, but when you compare it to the other languages, like they're creating unbelievable literature. In other words, writing and reading and recording uh, spectacular histories. And again, I'm not criticizing this because I'm using it now, but it's a way of explaining mentalities for me. So when I say outside that mentality, that's what I'm pretty much saying, outside maybe the system that was created by the English language, the colonial mentality, the imperial mentality, whatever you want to call it. And there's another part of the brain, there's lots of parts of the brain, but there are probably say, the frontal lobe. We call that the human mind. So as a person with a human mind, you can also step outside your mentality. And I know if you listen to people like Alan Watts or Zen or Buddhism, they talk about out of body experiences or going out of the mind. It's, it's a bit like that, but it's not going out of the mind. It's using the mind to step outside of this construct we call the mentality, the limbic system, where all our history and realities have been created and shaped and molded for us doesn't mean they're not real. It's just kind of a way to say that we can put a mentality in one hand and we can have the mind in the other. Or we can be the mind looking at the mentality and we can try to examine it like that. This might sound a bit crazy, but I think if you come from many other ethnic indigenous people, you might connect with this quite quickly uh, because outside of that mentality are the indigenous and ethnic minorities, people that did not originally come from there or were not most uh, affected by it, uh, crushed by it, but not necessarily most taken over. So I'll give you an example. Uh, again, I'm using examples, but not to be getting offended. So I'll give you one example. If we were to say this particular mentality, this English colonial mentality had invaded an island, a very deep, rich, complex, intelligent, educated um, society, they even believed back thousands of years ago that it was the land of the saints and the scholars. Recognized even by Rome and other uh, so-called civilizations, advanced civilizations, people that they mirror a lot of their, yeah, mirror a lot of their politics today is based a lot on Roman, which is brilliant and wonderful and good and all that kind of stuff. But in Ireland, um, they were admiring the Irish one, uh, recognized it as a deep, uh, historical origins and so much has been based on this but anyway despite all that wonderful stuff about this original mentality japan has the same thing china has the same thing india new zealand australia africa all the countries outside this had this and it's not to criticize one or the other or turn it into good bad and evil and all that kind of stuff it's about balance so with the irish one um our nearest neighbors have constructed up this language so much so that they used it as a tool and a weapon at the same time. A tool in favor of themselves and a weapon against those uh, that would try to go against it. This sounds a bit daft, but this is how colonization kind of works. But this one is kind of different. Again, when you base it on Noam Chomsky um, talking about how it's a system language. And I know people say, well, people have a mind outside their language, they're not just a language, you can have dual languages, different languages. Of course you can, and we can come to that. But this is a particular language, a particular systematic language. And unlike maybe other colonizations, I'm not quite sure, but instead of integrating, example, again, back in Ireland, this original mentality, like the other original mentalities, create the other nature and environment and so on and so forth. This one, when invaders usually can, well, they couldn't beat us most of the time anyway, 
Well, if they ever, if they ever really beat me, I don't think they ever had. But when they came here, they liked it so much that they integrated into the Irish mentality, best they could. I'll give you another example. When the Normans came, they couldn't beat us. And yet they found our culture, our society, our way of thinking, the way we view the world, our advancements in educations and medicines and science, going back very, very, very long time. When they seen that, felt that, of course, it took some, some advantages of it. But they also integrated, took it on, because they liked it. So they changed themselves from being Normans into normal. Okay, they might not have gone that far. But that was the gist of it. That's how powerful it was. So this other mentality was being put together, administrated, and mobilized in various different ways. And I, yeah, I go back into it just a bit more. This particular English uh, mentality was systematic, but it wasn't a language equally for all, so that you can take from it and recreate it and reshape it. It came mostly in orders, contracts, treaties, and stuff like that. The people throughout the ages, for several hundred years, I believe, use the English language for the peasants, but they themselves would use Italian, or sorry, uh, Latin, Spanish, French, any other language but the English. Some of the royals felt embarrassed when they had to write something in the English language and not in the Latin language, because the Latin language would have been the original language. Um, yeah, they would call it like a dumbed down language, that they only used it for the masses. But like all things, the masses grow and people adapt and other cultures come in and they take that language and they fix it up. Like the Irish had fixed up the English language by giving it its basis. But the English just had all the letters. You had to figure out. <laughs> so the Irish monks had split it up into spaces, but these spaces create these sentence words. And then other people came along and they would have molded and shaped that language and made it into a language. But nevertheless, it started off pretty much a instruction book orders um, and had to be followed accordingly. So that's the part I think that has lasted in, throughout the ages. Now if you take the royal family for example in England who have a different royal system than most, well they have a different one from the Scottish and the Irish one. Kings and queens are a completely different set up than the kings and queens in this one. Their ones are built on wealth and power and dominance. This one is based on honour and society. You, know, you couldn't just become king and queen. If you did you just couldn't give it to the next in line and so on and so forth. It may have happened, but it may happen because the youngest grew up with that experience and people were happy with that. But more times than often it came with a general consensus. In other words, everybody had to agree. Everybody had to pick vote themselves. So if they thought some fellow was the son of a good king, but if he was a bad person, they were going to say, no way, we'd rather go for this person. Sound, tone, he becomes king, he becomes a leader. Leader could get the head chopped off too, so don't guarantee it against anything. But that's how that system worked, it based on honour and had a completely different mentality than the English one. The English one had spread up through dominance and power and control. And the royals would have um, been at the very top of that. So if people think of the royals also, they might think of England, Scotland, France, Germany. That's pretty much one family. Like that's the mentality. It was the one family. So it could be the king, queen of England and France. Uh, but if not, there were still brothers and sisters, first cousins, and so on and so forth. So, but yeah, go back to the English one where they have the royals at the very top, and then they have their dominions, the people following the orders they must carry out, investors, uh, relations, or cousins. So they became wealthy because those two people at the top. But when the masses, the people grew and grew and grew, this became more intolerable. More so because while the royal families were growing over the time, so was their generations. And it was going to take a very long time for them to be king and queen. So the best way around that was to create companies. But they already had inherited these companies through royal favours. Like in Ireland, one guy could be given 40,000 acres. Another guy could be given 13,000, 14,000 acres. Not their land, but they give it to their own peoples for rewarding them with the riches of the land and bringing it back into England and making England rich. This is how the system started. This is how it's worked. It's never changed. <clears throat> so if you're still with me and I haven't fried your brain and I hope you're keeping an open mind, I'm just trying to understand that this is what's coming from this traveler. Could be blown out of the water and I could be told to go and read this and see this and feel this and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's all good and well. But I'm still coming from a particular mentality. 
from my original mentality using the words, all that other mentality doesn't come from anywhere else but this particular origin 1500 years ago, and it was a systematic like this, and has continued throughout. So. so these powerful elites who were appointed by the royals, uh, taken in by the royals, were related to the royals, had also became col uh, colonialists, but slightly different from the royals. The royals didn't, I think the royals cared as much about the people as they did, no, they didn't really. They chopped up people and everything. They didn't care about anyone. They were supremists. They did come from one family that ran Europe, had controlled Europe. And with that, not to be bring a religion too much into it, but even above that, there was another form of supremacy. And that was the Catholic colonial religion. Um, and again, Christianity was hijacked by uh, bad politics. People, I'm sure, get that now, they see that. So it doesn't mean it's against religion, but we have to recognize that religion itself was also hijacked with this particular mentality. So the Catholic religion, so on and so forth, uh, Protestants included, it doesn't matter. Uh, the Christianity was in part hijacked and it was used to the advantage, which almost the same system. It was the royal families and appointees that were going into the highest levels of the Christian dawn, the, the organization part of it. Same kind of system, who gets up, the priests, the bishops, and all up to the Pope. And just like the royal family, same kind of system, the law system, same kind of thing. So all these systems were mirrored and fixed on a European context. Why am I telling you this, even if it's old and it's history? Because I can tell you how it's still existing at this present moment. But before we get there, if we do get there in this talk, or this rant, whatever you want to call it, I'm going back into the travel mentality, the original Irish mentality, the one before it came infected with the English mentality. Nothing against the English people, I can't stress that enough. The English themselves were colonized by themselves, as hard as that as it is to believe. But I'm sure smart people from that um, history side would probably agree with that. Uh, the war of the British, the Britannia, uh, so on and so forth. So I won't make it complicated, but we're back to the Irish mentality in all of this. Why would this matter? Why would some guy who was fly from the European Western Christian belt have a right to talk about any other cultures outside of that? It's because for one, we're not from that mentality. We're not from that culture. That is not our way of thinking. It's been eroded, but you must keep in mind that that language has been eaten away in Ireland for the best part of eight, nine hundred years. It's been here a bit longer, but eventually it took over a place called Dublin, and then they called it the Pale, and then they put up a fence, and then it was dominantly English, and Vikings, it was dominated, dominated by the English. So that mentality came in. So to even the rest of the parts of Ireland, particularly to the West, were speaking in their Irish mentality. They weren't oblivious of what was going on. There was lots of wars, lots of conflicts, lots of deaths, because people were persisting and resisting this English mentality. They were putting into the heads of people. Um, people just fundamentally disagreed with it. And this is recorded facts, we know this. Same way when it went to any other land, when it went to Africa, when it went to India, went to China, went to Japan, uh, people resisted it. They knew this language was so contradictory and so full of itself that it was just outright supremacy, that it was designed to take almost control of everything and everyone and send all its worth in value and gold and diamonds and labor back to a very small few who themselves weren't even speaking the language and had little or no regard for it as long as it was being used effectively as a system that brought back wealth of one kind or another. So why has the travel mentality any stake in all of this? Centuries right up to this present moment. Complex topics and subjects, and yet they don't seem to be that complex, um, coming from particular mentalities. But when you are in the settled colonial mentality, the imperial mentality, your world is completely different. You see out, you believe the world was created within this mentality that's always been like this. And in actual fact, most people think the world they speak English. And if they don't, they can't, they can't understand why they don't. Um, because that's supremacy. So when you meet people who are highly intelligent, whether they're India or if they're from Africa or from Native American tribes, Aborigines, no matter where, this mentality sees them as them trying to be 
like this mentality, this great, wonderful mentality. So they might, uh, they might not have the same English. In other words, I don't even have the same English as the English. It took me a long time to sort of sound like this, get these words out. But when you meet people that can't say all the words or have a, a particular kind of way of pronouncing English, perfectly fine in the way they pronounce it because that's the language they learned. It's not the language they came with. You couldn't speak their languages. But you're expecting this, these people to speak this language and if they don't speak it well, or if you don't speak in the way that's actually satisfying to you, you reject it. So you don't see the other mentalities, you don't see the other cultures, you don't see the origins of other people's ideas and how they're shaped. Because this systematic mentality that has been existing existence for 500 years in terms of being systematic, because imperialism really gave it the works. In other words, it created places like Trinity College, Dublin College, these would have been the Queen's Colleges, based on an Anglo-Saxon vibe to it. It had to be administrated like this. And it wasn't for everyone. It only had to be really with people that were really going to believe in the supremacy act of the Crown and pump all these ideas back in that direction by converting all those around them. So it might have started off as a Protestant uh, project to get the Protestant ideas out in there, create scholars and theologians and all these intellectual people to make it look like they know what they're talking about. Not, nothing antagonizing to the Protestants, not anti Protestants. Catholics were doing the exact same thing. Christianity was doing the exact same thing. You're all doing the exact same thing. So, actually, you know what? I'm going to finish it up on that there, right? Because I know it's a bit of a rant. And your brain is probably prime. You're probably not making sense of this. And I could be rambling on and not even making sense. But this is all kind of new to me in many ways also, because like I said, I didn't have the formal education. I still don't. I said, I kind of don't want it now. There you have it. <laughs> it's not to knock the education system. There's a wonderful, wonderful things about the education. But there's something about the system of it and how it's administrated. Like, you know, the Protestants use it for the Protestants. The Catholics were using it for the bishops and so on and so forth. The royal families were using it for their advantage. So it has that kind of systematic feel to it, even from then right to this present day. Like if you take, for example, um, how would administrate it back then? Protestants, rich people, middle class people, no working class people could get, ever get in. Uh, no ethnic minorities or black people or brown people could ever get in. And it's all white, middle class, anglicized uh, people. And they ruled the roost. And they were pumping out all these forms of their versions of reality to the education system. Now it's going to be at my door. I'm going to leave it at that and we'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you didn't like this, that's okay. But if you do, let me know. <laughs>